to the last segment of our our knitting slash yarn series. Today we're actually going to learn a little bit about how yarn is produced and uh, the spinning wheel, how the spinning wheel works, and a little bit of history about the spinning wheel as well. So how is yarn created? Now that we've learned how to do basic knitting, how did we get the yarn that we actually are knitting with? So yarn comes in three basic uh, classifications. There is man-made yarn, which is your yarn that is acrylic. It might be called nylon. It might be called poly uh, polyamide. Comes under some, several different names, but the first acrylic yarn was invented in 1941 by DuPont. So if you have any articles like blankets, things like that, that predate 1941, they do not have any acrylic in them. So acrylic fibers are actually produced by taking a series of chemicals. They are put into a vat, boiled down to a slurry, and then they are extracted or pulled out um, into long fibers. And those fibers are then spun um, or like filaments, and then those filaments are then spun uh, together to create acrylic yarns. The next category would be plant-based yarns. Now, plant-based yarns would be cotton, bamboo, um, flax, and hemp is a fairly new um, category as well. It's very similar to um, knitting or crocheting with linen um, it's a little bit coarser feel to, uh, to it than cotton is. And then the third type are animal-based, which would be your wools, your angora, um, mohair, things like that. So we're going to break those down and talk a little bit about each one of them. Now the first yarn we are going to talk about is would be the acrylic yarns. These are generally, um, you're going to find them in your big box stores, like your Red Heart, most of your Lion brand. Sometimes they will contain um, a little bit of wool, but for the most part, they are nylon or acrylic. Now, the good properties about that is uh, they're cheap. They're washable. You can throw them in the washer, in the dryer. You can't do a whole lot to damage them. However, over time, they don't hold up. You could have a wool sweater that's 50 years old and look as good as the day it was, it was knit. And acrylic is not going to last that long. The fibers will wear through. They're not as tough as a natural fiber would be. Uh, they also don't have as much stretch. So when you finish a project and you block it, which is called kind of reshaping it, where you put it through uh, some water and then stretch it back into the original shape or stretch it out so that the design uh, shows up a little bit better. An acrylic does not have a whole lot of stretch that way. Um, you know, there's there's just not a whole lot of elasticity in the yarn itself. So that would be your acrylics. Your plant-based fiber, I have a couple to show you. Where did my cotton go? There it is. The two plant-based fibers that I have to show you are actually a cotton it's a cotton denim mix. Uh, what was done was in order to create the yarn or the fiber, which is here, it was it took cotton and then it also took um, old blue jeans and recycled them by shredding them. It is extremely soft. But one of the problems with it is cotton has very, very short fibers. You know, as you can see, when I say a fiber, when you pull it apart and you pull one length, you get a small little portion. You can see this is probably an, about an inch and a quarter long. You have to, you, when you're using a spinning wheel, you're going to have to spin this at a very fast rate to incorporate all these fibers. Otherwise, it's not going to stay together. It's going to be just falling apart. So um, it, it is very soft. It's, it's not hard to spin with, but you do need to spin at a much faster rate. Next is flax. Now, this, this is the other example I have of flax. Flax is very coarse. Um, 
its fibers can be long. You can see here, here's a fiber. Here is some fiber from flax. Now the thing with flax is, unlike wool that has microscopic barbs in it, which I'll talk about in a minute, fiber that is plant-based does not have barbs in it. It does not naturally stick together. And in the case of flax, you may wonder, well, where do they get it from? This is actually the inside of a stalk. Um, flax, when it grows, looks similar to like cattails. And they actually cut them down, cut the stalks down. They soak them. They break them open. And this is the sinew that is inside the stalk. It then has to be combed over and over and over again to get all of what they call the toe out of it. Toe as in T-O-W. Um, that would be like the loose bits. The, the, they want just the finest stuff that is the softest. And it still maintains a natural glue inside these fibers. So when you would spin these together, they're not naturally going to stick together you have to actually spin them with your fingers damp. You have to have a little bowl of water and spin the fiber wet. What the wetness does, it reactivates the natural glues that are in there and it will stick the, it will stick the fibers together by reactivating the natural glues within the fiber itself. So when I show you the spinning wheel downstairs, and I mentioned that it's also known as a flax wheel because you could have your hands free, this is why. Because um, in order to spin flax, you have to be able to have both hands free, one for the spinning, one to get your hands damp, so you can actually do the, do the um, reactivate the glue in it as you're going through. Now flax, you may be wondering what in the world do you use flax for? If you have linen anywhere in your house, it's made with flax. When flax is actually um, spun up, flax is the name of the plant. But once you spin it into yarn and you start weaving with it, it is then also known as linen. So that's where your linen comes from. So these are your tablecloths in their, in their roughest form. <laughs> Now the last fiber would be the animal-faced fibers, which are your wools. Now some of you might say, I don't like wool because it's scratchy. Not all wool is scratchy. Uh, wool that is depend scratchiness on a, on, scratchy wool is dependent on several things. Number one, what type of a sheep it came, or animal it came off of what kind of where on the animal it came off of and how it was spun. If it was coarsely spun, like this is some coarser fiber that I have here. It is wool. It really is not uncomfortable. I could wear this against my skin, but it's nowhere near as soft as this is. This is merino. This is natural colored merino. This is from different colors of sheep. It is extremely, extremely soft. You could wear this against your skin. Unless you're allergic to wool, you could wear this with no problem. However, some are rougher. Now, some of the things that can make it rougher, like I said, are the type of the sheep it comes off of, but it also can depend on how it is spun. When you look at wool and it's put into this, this clump, this is called rovings. Here's some here. This is merino wool, and it's been... It's been placed into rovings. A roving just means it's like in a long cord. It's been cleaned. In this case, it's been dyed and it's been combed. When they comb a fiber, it pulls all of the fibers the same direction. So you can see here, the fibers are all running vertically. If I was just to grab a hunk of wool and start spinning, the fibers would be going all over the directions. That is what can cause some of the scratchiness. So um, the finer, the, the, the more processed it is, the, the smoother it becomes. There's also what they call now superwash merinos, which this is a superwash merino. It means that it has been treated chemically. It's a, it's a 
It's an animal-based product. It's natural. However, they have treated it so that you can put it through the washing machine. Now, you're going to put it through delicate. You're not going to put it through with your regular clothing, but you could wash it. So um, a lot depends, like I said, on the sheep. Now, wool can come in different lengths of fibers. Some could be short. Some can be long. It all depends on the sheep that they come off of. And the longer the fiber, the slower you can use the spinning, the slower the spinning wheel needs to rotate. The shorter the fiber, the faster it needs to rotate to incorporate all of the fibers. Wool is very easy to spin with because wool has a natural microscopic barb in it. Um, you wouldn't feel it just by running your hands over it, but if you looked at it underneath the microscope, you would see little teeny barbs, and those barbs cause fiber to cling to itself. If I did this, you can see how they, they naturally cling when I pull them apart. That's because of the microscopic barbs. Uh, felt is created from wool because of the natural barbs. If you were to throw an unprocessed piece of wool through your wash, it would felt because of the microscopic barbs. Um, if I was to put just a little bit of this with some moisture in my hands, rub it together, it would turn into felt because of, like I said, the microscopic barbs. That is something that's very easy to spin because it grabs onto itself. Whereas the plant-based and the acrylic does not, doesn't have the barbs, so it doesn't work quite as easily. Now, not all wool comes from sheep. Wool can also be found on camels. It can be found on muskox. It can be found on alpaca. And there's two very, very rare types of wool. They're extremely expensive. Um, for instance, this is four ounces of merino wool. I think I paid, oh, there it is. I paid $16 for it. Yeah, there it is. I paid $16 for it. So roughly $4 per ounce. That's kind of the going price at this time for merino wool. If I was, and alpaca is about the same price per ounce, maybe a little bit more, but not by much between four and six dollars per ounce. However, there's two very rare wools. They are considered the most, the, the softest in the world. Those are vicunias and kiviet. Those two can run over a hundred dollars per ounce. Needless to say, I'm not going to be using them anytime soon, but I have felt a shawl made out of it. It would be like a small inheritance to have to make a shawl out of this, but it was extremely soft. So the alpaca is like in the third level of softness. So it's it's the poor man's vicuña or kiviet. So um, it's definitely more reasonable. And alpaca is extremely soft. Below that, something that would be easiest to get would be your uh, merinos. And like I said, fibers can come in natural colors. These have not been dyed. These are different colors from different sheep. Or they can be dyed. The white here is probably not dyed, but the rest of it was dyed. So they come in a variety, or you can process them yourself and then dye them as well. So before I show you my spinning wheel downstairs and how yarn is created, I thought it would be good to learn a little bit about spinning wheels as well as the history of spinning. The first spinning wheel was invented in China in 1000 AD, so they've been around over a thousand years at this point. Uh, the wheels that we are most familiar with, there are three different types that you see the most often. The first wheel would be one that you see in a lot of antique stores. You do see people using them once in a while, but not very often. It's called the Great Wheel. It's also known as the Walking Wheel or the Wool Wheel. Um, I'm going to insert a picture of what that one looks like. Now that wheel does not have any power uh, with, you don't power it with your feet. You literally stand up and turn it with your hands. It is 
therefore called the walking wheel because you cannot sit down and spin with this wheel. Another interesting thing about it is when you think about the fairy tale Sleeping Beauty, a lot of times they picture a traditional spinning wheel. That's not what she pricked her finger on. She pricked her finger on a walking wheel because that is the only spinning wheel that has a point where the bobbin would be. And so it looks almost like a nail. And that's what the, the winding of the yarn goes on to is this nail like protrusion. And that would be what Sleeping Beauty pricked her finger on. The next type of wheel is called a parlor wheel. It's also known as a castle wheel. And as you can see in the picture, the wheel sits directly on top of the bobbin. They are one of the smaller spinning wheels and that's why they were called a parlor wheel. They could be sat in a, in a corner. They don't take up as much space. Sometimes they have one pedal on the bottom. Sometimes they have two. Uh, my daughter had one that had two wheel, uh, had two pedals on the bottom, but you can, you can get either one. And then the third one is the type of spinning wheel that I have, which is a traditional wheel. It's also known as a Saxony wheel or a flax wheel. Now spinning itself was done in the home for the most part. And like I said, the spinning wheel was developed in 1000 AD. However, as technology came along and the industrial revolution occurred, uh, they became, they, they, they developed ways that you could spin um, larger quantities at a faster rate and they were doing so commercially. One of the first commercial spinning factories in the United States was in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. It's called Slater Mill and you can go through that. Um, it is open for tours and it was a water-based spinning factory. So in other words, they had a water wheel just like you would like for a mill and that water wheel drove belts that in turn turned the wheels or turned the spinning bobbins themselves. So when you see a spinning wheel like the one I'm going to show you downstairs, the power or the motor, so to speak, is your foot pedaling that wheel. But in a factory type of setting, the water wheel outside the building was actually driving belts inside the building, which was turning the bobbin. So in, in a factory situation, you didn't have the pedals, you didn't have the wheel, you, you just had the bobbin spinning. And so they could do many, many bobbins at one time, all driven by belts that are run by the water wheel outside the mill. Uh, this was done, uh, the first, let's see, Slater Mill was, was developed and opened in 1793. Now in the 1920s, um, when electricity was more readily available and used more widely, the spinning mills stopped being used by water, being powered by water power and they developed use by electricity. Now these mills um, could operate on an even faster scale than the water driven mills. They were very large mills and if you want to see one still in operation, uh, it's owned by the National Park Service and that is Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, it's the Lowell Spinning Mills up there. Up at that location, they actually would spin the yarn, but they also would weave the yarn. And when I went there years ago, um, they only had two of the power looms working at the time. And the whole building was literally shaking from the power just from two looms. And a traditional room had 60 looms working in it at one time. So um, they said they could no longer operate more than two at a time because it would put the foundation of the building into jeopardy. But that was originally a water powered factory that was then transferred over to electricity once that became more readily available. So now we're gonna take a look at my spinning wheel. Now we'll take a look at the wheel that I have. It is called a traditional wheel or a flax wheel or a Saxon wheel. Now the reason it's called um, the flax wheel is because in order to spin flax, and I will explain this when I show the different fibers, flax is spun in a different way than wool and cotton are spun. And you need to have your hands free. And if you were using a walking wheel, you would not have both hands free. This particular type of spinning wheel has a foot pedal right here. And 
that foot pedal actually powers the wheel itself. So now I will show you a little bit about how this wheel works and how it actually spins. The actual portion that produces yarn is this section right here. This is called the flywheel and the bobbin. This whole entire section here is called the maiden head. It actually has two supports here that hold this bobbin. Now the flywheel moves, but the bobbin moves also. So to keep them from not moving at quite the same speed, there's this little knob right here. It's connected to a piece of fishing line that runs over the top of this edge of the bobbin. It has a groove on it. Let's see if I can move this so you can see it a little bit better. Here you can see this band. This is the brake. It moves over the bobbin here and then is connected to the knob right here. This just helps control the tension. The brake just helps control the tension of the bobbin because if the bobbin spun at the same speed that the flywheel spins, you wouldn't get any yarn put onto the bobbin itself. Now these little pegs that are here along the flywheel are just used and you can see I've got some and you can see I've got some right here. This just controls where your uh, fiber is loading onto the bobbin. So you can see it is now loading right here. If this starts to fill up, I would just move it over to the next section and it would start filling up the next portion of the bobbin. Now here is the, here is the fiber that I am spinning. I just have it wrapped around here so it doesn't undo. But you can see it's being twisted before it actually enters the bobbin. Here you can see what it looked like before, and here is how you can see it is being twisted. It then goes into this little hole here. This is called the orifice. It comes out of the orifice on the other side here. And again, it is already spun, and that's when it travels up and over onto the bobbin. Now when you look at a spinning wheel, you have to think in the days before the Industrial Revolution when there was electricity, this is your motor. The wheel and the pedal are the actual motor. It's just foot powered. This, as you can see, has a drive band. This drive band runs down to a, another gear basically, that is attached to that flywheel, which creates the spinning motion and makes it turn. So I am going to do a little bit of spinning now and show you how it actually becomes spun and how it loads onto the bottom. The twisting is actually working between the orifice and my finger that's holding this right here. This is twisted, this is not. So as, as I let a twist build up here, I will pull this fiber between my two fingers here. Once I release this hand, that twist will come down into this section between my fingers, and then I will move it forward and it'll go eventually onto the bobbin. So I'm gonna try to do this in slow motion so you can see what I'm doing. I've let the twist build up on my right hand. I'm going to release it, and that twist is now down to my left hand. I'm going to move a little forward. And I'm going to keep processing. This way I let the twist build up, and I release. And I let the twist build up, and I release.
Now we'll do it at a regular speed so you can see what it would normally look like. Now what I'm doing is called short draft, which means I don't have a whole lot of space between my fingers. If I was spinning with a fiber that was a longer fibered uh, roving, then I could actually do what's called long drafting, where you actually can spread your fingers further and further apart. So a lot depends on the length of the fiber that you are actually spinning in order to do that. Now what I've been spinning is just one ply. In other words, it's only one strand. But if you look closely at your yarn, it's usually two, between two and four strands that are called plied together. In other words, they're twisted together, which makes it stronger. The more plies, the stronger the yarn. So how would you do that? Well, you use an item called a Lazy Kate. Now this has some alpaca on it. So this is also a single strand. I will eventually, when this bobbin fills up and this bobbin fills up, I will use this Lazy Kate. Both bobbins will be on this. And I will take the two of them and I will spin them back through the spinning wheel and they will twist together. Now, if you noticed when I was spinning, I was spinning the wheel clockwise, meaning it's going this direction. But when you ply yarn, you have to actually have the wheel spin the other direction. Otherwise, it will over twist or untwist the yarn that you are trying to ply together. So let me show you what it looks like when it is plied together. Here is some, the light tan that is in this. This is a two ply. The light tan that is in this is alpaca, just like the one I showed you that's on my Lazy Kate. And the, the different colored yarn that is in here is the yarn that I am spinning on the spinning wheel right now. So let's look at it a little closer. Here you can see it, and here you can see the two plies, and you can see how they are twisting together. This is called barber poling the way it looks because it's striped like a barber pole. You can see it really well on this thicker piece right here. So I hope you have enjoyed this series and found it interesting. And uh, thank you for watching, and I will see you again soon.